The front page of the New York Times read, Bolsheviks seize state buildings. Soon, those Bolsheviks would seize much more, remaking Russia and, in many ways, the world political order in the process. And yet, in Russia today, under President Vladimir Putin, whose fondness for the Soviet era is well known, the 100th anniversary was barely officially acknowledged. Why? Let's ask. In New York, New York, via Skype, Nina Khrushcheva, professor of international affairs at the New School and a senior fellow at the World Policy Institute. And Nina, we're always delighted to have you on our program. How are you doing tonight? Thank you. Very well, thank you. There was a parade in Moscow yesterday for the 100th anniversary, but it was actually not to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. Apparently, instead, it was a parade to observe the anniversary of Stalin's big advance against the Germans in 1941. Can you help us understand this? Well, I mean, as you mentioned, uh Putin barely acknowledges the anniversary of the revolution. He doesn't like revolutions. We've seen it um, many, many times over. He didn't like a revolution in Ukraine in 2004, the Orange Revolution. Uh, he didn't like the revolution in Georgia, so all these former republics, even less he liked the Maidan revolution in Ukraine in 2013, because all these revolutionary movements uh, for less corrupt government for freedom from the Russian influence. In fact, he believes, and probably and actually rightly, correctly, uh, threatens his own regime. So the Russians today stay away from the commemoration of the revolution. Something needed to be done, however, because it is a 100th anniversary. So it was a very funny, I thought, very kind of entertaining. It's like, uh, you know, Dances on Ice or something, Disney on Ice parade. Uh, on the Red Square that doesn't essentially mention a revolution at all, but talks about uh, the 70-plus anniversary of uh, Moscow defending itself from the Nazis in 1941. And it sort of started in a bizarre way. It started from the origins of the Russian state and up to today. It is interesting that uh, you compare it in some respects to a reality TV show. It did have that flavor of it, and I see Donald Trump behind you there, so uh, all of that is coming together in my head right now. But tell me this, is there, is there sort of an official um, view of the October Revolution in the Kremlin today? Well, the official view is that um, monarchy was good, but monarchy was restrictive. And so the revolutionaries, the Bolsheviks, tried to make it better and make it different. Uh, they did not succeed in exactly the way they wanted to. Uh, essentially, Vladimir Lenin didn't succeed in the way he wanted to because on one hand, he did a revolution. On the other hand, his hand wasn't strong enough. And I think that's sort of Putin's bigger objection, that he allowed way too many freedoms, which, of course, for a Soviet person like me, sounds completely ridiculous because Bolsheviks allowed no freedoms whatsoever, but certainly allowed less freedoms, I mean, sorry, sorry, sorry more freedoms than Stalin did. And Stalin is uh, Putin's, in many ways, kind, kind of unofficial hero. And so, uh, of course, the Bolsheviks who gave it in and Stalin took over are not Putin's heroes, but Stalinist and Stalin himself is. And it is interesting being Putin being somewhat secretive and trying to be all man for all people. He doesn't mention Stalin personally as his, pers as his hero, but anything that he believes in, in a strong hand and the country that should not really shed territories, uh, that Ukraine, Georgia, and other republics cannot have independence uh, and whatnot. This is all very Stalinesque. So if that kind of he reconciles it in his own head that uh, he's not necessarily a fan of Lenin, but he was a fan of the Soviet Empire. And for him, Soviet Empire is not Leninist. It's actually Stalinist. Well, here's what the president had to say almost a couple of years ago about Vladimir Lenin. He said, ruling with your ideas as a guide is correct, but that is only the case when that idea leads to the right results not like it did with Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. In the end, that idea led to the ruin of the Soviet Union. There were many of these ideas, such as providing regions with autonomy. They planted an atomic bomb under the building that is called Russia, and which would later explode. We did not need a global revolution either. It sounds 
Nina, like when you read between the lines here, according to Putin, Lenin's big mistake was that he allowed too much regionalism. What does he mean by that? Well, he means by that that sort of the idea uh, behind Lenin's sort of regionalism, and that's also um, a great um, kind of a stretch to say that Lenin allowed too much regionalism, and actually because Lenin was collecting the uh, Russian Empire into the Soviet Empire, and he was very adamant about that. But there was a little bit of a clause in saying that countries would have the right to, uh, to self-determination and the decision to um, opt out of being part of the Soviet system, which, of course, Stalin was very much disagreeing with, because for him, Stalin was not that the autonomy would be, for Stalin, the autonomy would be very broad autonomy, is that we in the center, the Kremlin would decide what kind of autonomy the um, uh, the regions or the republics would get. And I find it actually it's so very brilliantly Putinesque is to say that Lenin, by the way, died in 1924, is to say that he ruined the Soviet Union only seven years after he essentially established it. And the Soviet Union then, of course, lasted until 1991. It's just a remarkable, remarkable um, acrobatic view of history, sort of the Salta Martali that only Putin can can do so brilliantly choosing pieces of history and politics that he likes into in his own empire and kind of discarding those that he doesn't think are useful to him. Well, help us get our Western minds around this one. Lenin, I guess, was responsible for the deaths of millions. Stalin was responsible for the deaths of, I guess, dozens of millions. Who today in Russia is seen as worse? Uh, well, Lenin is highly relevant in Russia, and that's actually, I find it very interesting that uh, in the West we talk about the um, uh, commemoration of the 100th anniversary and how it's possible, how it's not possible. In Russia, it's really not quite a big deal. I mean, people remember Lenin. Lenin is in every, uh, in every square, main square in, uh, across all the territory of, of um, the Russian Federation. I just went across the territory of the Russian Federation, all 11 time zones, and there is Lenin's everywhere. I mean, probably 5,000, 7,000 all told. So, uh, but that is it. He is a statue. He is no longer an active figure of politics. Stalin, however, is. And uh, Stalin is important for the Russian psyche today. People remember that that's when um, the country was respected, that Stalin turned the peasant country into industrialized country and whatnot. So, and precisely because uh, Stalin is Putin's hero, even without uh, Putin mentioning his name that often, uh, that actually keeps Stalin uh, very much alive. And when I traveled through Russia, it was quite remarkable to see that the only two leaders really Russia recognizes in the Soviet period, it's Stalin or post-Soviet period as well, Stalin and Putin. And the rest of them, Lenin is a statue. Khrushchev and Gorbachev do not exist. In Leonid Brezhnev, uh, uh, the period from um, uh, the period in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, is the man who was a sort of softer bridge between, between Stalin and Putin. But essentially, only two leaders remain as major characters in uh, Russian political historiography of the 20th century. Well, let me understand the place Lenin has in Russia then, because I gather it is still a very hotly debated issue as to whether or not Lenin's tomb ought to still be in public and visible to the public. I gather there was a poll taken a while ago which suggested that by a two-to-one margin, people thought, it's time already, let's just bury him. Do Russians want to be done with the whole Russian Revolution uh, I guess that sacred moment of Russian history? Well, I don't think Russians really see that as a sacred moment of their history because with Putin, monarchy really came back. I mean, you know, Putin is known to be called Putin the First. Um, I mean, he's not Vladimir the First, there are very many, and he certainly very carefully creates um, heritage from uh, the original baptizer of uh, the Kievan Ru uh, Russia, Kievan Rus, uh, in. Um, uh, in the 1900s, Vladimir the Great uh, and all these other Vladimirs is, uh, or greats are his predecessors. A lot of it, in fact, are 
uh, emperors, people who were before Lenin came in in, in 1917. So it's not really a very hotly debated issue, but it is a little bit of a bizarre thing is that if Lenin doesn't exist in Russian history so much and he's only uh, a statue rather than an actual former politician or former leader uh, who is recognized, then the mausoleum is a useless thing. I think what I've also seen when I traveled across Russia is that if Putin had his way, he probably would have replaced every Lenin with a Stalin or Ivan the Terrible or Vladimir the Great or Peter the Great or Catherine the Great. Uh, and that would be kind of an interesting way of having his own cult of personality without having himself being on that kind of pedestals that Lenin is now on. So, so far, I think... Lenin is being kept because they haven't figured out how to get rid of him without creating a national conversation, which may lead to a counter-revolution or something. I think that's why we're still seeing the mausoleum. But I think that the time is soon to come when uh, that, that problem would be addressed. Well, for what it's worth, I hear it costs 200,000 American dollars every year to keep that mausoleum open, which probably is not Very that... Cheap. It's not that Very much money cheap. when you consider what the oh, tourism must bring. Absolutely. But also what, you know, for for the peace of mind and kind of this uh, formula of stagnation of the Lenin, uh, Lenin personality or Lenin, uh, kind of Lenin tom that really means nothing anymore, I think it's a very, really small price to pay. In fact, Putin can easily afford it from his own pocket. <laughs> well, here's another set of numbers that I'd like you to comment on, and that is, this is a poll now going back to last year, and uh, I don't know if polls in Russia are any more accurate than the ones over here, but here's what it said. 56% of Russians wish that the Soviet Union had never collapsed, and 53% deem Lenin's role in Russian history to have been entirely or largely positive. What do you infer from those numbers? Well, I mean, the Russians certainly do not, didn't want the Soviet Union to collapse. Um, it was a big country. It was an important country. Russians like their big country to be big. That's another thing that I've seen um, over uh, during my travels. Uh, and the Soviet Union was a bigger country. And, uh, um, you know, it had other smaller places that, Russia fully, or at least Putin's Russia, believes it should be in control of, not probably not uh, necessarily as a subject, sort of not republics as subjects of, of the Kremlin, but certainly within its very firm sphere of influence. And that really uh, makes people believe that the Soviet Union should not have collapsed. As for Lenin, the 53 Russians do like power, and he was once a powerful leader, although, of course, then being highly upstaged by Stalin and Putin and, and, and others. So I think it is a historical number. It really doesn't hold much um, um, kind of much importance. The important part of it probably is that uh, that was the, uh, he began the 20th century that uh, we now came to understand and to know. And he also brought essentially the country that, uh, you know, became uh, one of the uh, major adversaries of the United States in the Cold War. It stood up to the United States. And I think uh, he's understood as the beginning of that process. And for that, he's being appreciated. I really don't think that if you ask people what exactly Lenin did, except for, um, you know, being the leader of the revolution, that would tell you exactly what the revolution was about or what exactly did he do. And uh, how did he lead Russia in the first five, whatever, he lasted five years, five years of the rule of the beginning of the Soviet Union? Hmm. Uh, again, as we try on this anniversary to understand the Russian mind better, I want to quote, uh, this is just an anonymous uh, young woman quoted in the Financial Times last month on the issue of the revolution, and she had this to say, I give the revolution credit for putting Russia on her feet. The USSR was a great power. I am Ukrainian by nationality and have Moldovan citizenship. My parents were born in Ukraine, and I was already born in Moldova, but we are all compatriots. Our homeland is the USSR. Now, this is a quote from a woman who never lived in the Soviet Union, and yet somehow that still resonates with her. Can you explain that to us? Well, I mean, my point exactly, I just, before that, I just said that, mm -hmm. is that, 
it's a big country. Russians don't live in small countries. They do like to uh, feel themselves as, um, you know, I mean, the, the, Soviet, the Soviet Union possessed was essentially Eurasian continent. I mean, it was very little part of it went to Europe, but the rest of it was, uh, was Russia. It, it took almost the whole continent. Russia still is the largest country in the world. And that does appeal to those Russians and even those non-Russians who were born, born with it, within that framework or remember that framework, that that was an internationalist country that uh, um, was able to stand up for the rest of the world and to show that it also is powerful and important and whatnot. And I find it really quite remarkable that when you travel across Russia today, this is the first thing you hear. Uh, that uh, uh, we were, even when you ask people about, you know, Stalin and how could they possibly still worship him, uh, people would say, well, um, they were, maybe we were killed and imprisoned, but our parades were great. So this is actually, <laughs> to, to, to today's parade is quite important. I mean, uh, it was a, a Mickey Mouse parade, but it was made in a grandiose kind of manner. And I think it does matter to the Russians. Yeah, but what's strange about that answer, though, at least to my ears, is that the, I mean, the whole foundation for what the Soviet Union was supposed to be about, we know it wasn't, but what it was supposed to be about were these ideals of equality and justice, and yet none of that is reflected in her answer. It's all about being a big player on the world stage. So, well, go ahead. That doesn't, I mean, no, but that's exactly, as, uh, as Gorbachev would say in your question, there is an answer. I mean, <laughs> there, is an an there is an answer in this, is that size matters. I mean, that's, that's probably uh, when Putin said that uh, uh, the uh, uh, collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe in, in the 20th century. That's exactly what the story is. It is a geopolitical catastrophe. It's suddenly, that huge chunk of land that regardless of the quality of your life, you still would be very proud of or supposed to be very proud of because everybody is afraid of us. Everybody is, uh, is respecting us because we are strong and we, you know, we can rebel the, uh, the Nazi invasion and all these other things that we associate with the greatness of the Soviet Union. That what he meant is that the geopolitical, that suddenly that geopolitics change, suddenly Russia is not that big. Uh, suddenly, it's not going all the way into Middle East. You know, you have to go to Syria in order to be in the Middle East because before it was easy. It was just, you know, Uzbekistan and all the republics uh, next to it. That was us too, and now it is not. So I think it is reflected in uh, uh, in a lot of people's responses. My colleague here in New York is a woman from Lithuania who is younger than me. She was barely born into the Soviet Union, and she kept saying, well, it's too bad that it collapsed because it was big and therefore it deserved to be great. Hmm. Let me uh, repeat the names of the four main leaders that we have talked about on this program so far, starting with Lenin, going to Stalin, then Brezhnev, and now Putin. Does it seem to you that Russia is destined for time immemorial to look for, for lack of a better word, czars around which to organize their society? Well, so far it has been the case, which I find slightly mind-boggling because I thought that after 91 uh, and with Gorbachev's perestroika, so that's another name, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, <clears throat> who is, by the way, highly unpopular in, in Russia precisely because he was trying to, uh, uh, trying to kind of demystify and uh, somewhat democratize that monolithic uh, belief system that the great country um, uh, destined to have one leader who is going with a, his strong hand is going to arrange everybody's life from uh, Kaliningrad to Kamchatka. So, um, yes, I thought that that was ending, but clearly not. And with Putin being there for 17 years and planning uh, probably to stay for another six if not more, uh, for, for the time being, yes, that's the case. But I actually also don't believe that there are destinies for countries. Like things can change. I mean, things can, um, you know, things can fall off. I mean, China can take parts uh, over the Amur River and suddenly Russia would get smaller. Germany could reclaim 
Kaliningrad, which used to be German, uh, East Prussian, Königsberg. Uh, Japan can take the uh, Kuril Island that they've been wanting to do. And so things can, this geopolitics can change even further. And if geopolitics changes, I do believe that Russian politics also changes with it. And just so far, in my view, Russia hasn't collapsed enough uh, not to start put all its baskets into all its uh, eggs into one basket that is its size and not believe that just one person in the Kremlin is going to solve all problems uh, from one uh, from the western side of Russia to its eastern side. Well, in fact, I think you have said on our program in the past that you thought Russia was too big for its own good. And I was actually going to mention the fact that I think this past year you did go from Kaliningrad to Kamchatka for a uh, a travel across Russia. Is it still your view that it's too big a country for its own good? Um, yes, I do think that to be governed properly, it is a too big for its own good. Uh, but what was striking to me, what I've discovered, that Russia is a remarkably homogeneous country. Uh, homogeneous in a sense with all its diversity. And, you know, remember Barack Obama memorably said that it's a regional power. Well, it's a multi-regional power. There's a lot of powers around it, from Germany to Poland, to the Baltics, to uh, Mongolia, to China, to Japan, to South Korea, and North Korea, and, and whatnot. So there's a lot of other powers that influence that particular power. But what I was uh, really struck by is that how Russian everybody is. I mean, how, for example, if we take Crimea, as you know, was annexed by Russia from Ukraine in 2014, and uh, uh, Crimea is everywhere. Crimea is in Vladivostok, which is a wonderful place across the Pacific Ocean. You can see Sarah Palin and say hello to her in her backyard. <laughs> so it is very far away from Crimea. And here you are in Vladivostok driving on a highway, and you see right on the side of the highway there's a, a map of Crimea right there, right in front of you on the Pacific, Pacific Ocean that says, here is the Russian peninsula, and Crimea is of Russian origins. So it really never goes away from you. And Kaliningrad, which is also not necessarily close to Ukraine and Crimea, uh, as you may know, they live, uh, because it, it used to be German territory taken by the Russians in 1940, by the Soviets in 1945 after World War II. And the whole culture of that place is based on Germany, on uh, German, particularly German philosopher Immanuel Kant, which is who is essentially playing the Lenin role in Kaliningrad. And you ask them, how do you feel that you base your culture? I mean, you sort of live in somebody else's greatness because it's not your cultural great greatness. Kant is not a Russian philosopher. To which a person says to me, well, Crimea is ours, which means is whatever we took, we're going to keep. So in this sense, it's very monolithic and very Russian and very supportive of uh, Putin that he keeps Russian borders intact. And he does govern that way because, for example, uh, all the cities that are very remote from Moscow, they owe their roads to the Kremlin. They owe their trans transportation, transportation system to the Kremlin. And that is something that really unites them because uh, the local governance is uh, somewhat corrupt and somewhat inefficient. And the Kremlin likes to keep it this way because it does want to be a grand solution to the local problems. And that continues. And I actually don't think that until Russia collapses further, that central periphery problem is going to be solved. Hmm. Nina Khrushcheva, we're always delighted to have you on our program. And even if the official Russian government doesn't want to observe the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. We've done it here on TVO tonight, and thank you for contributing to our coverage. Thank you very much. Спасибо. Спасибо вам. And до свидания. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit tvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.